Hello everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we are going to be revising the full A-level physics specification on oscillations and we are starting with simple harmonic motion. Now let's have a look at some of the basic terms that we're going to be using. So first of all, displacement. This is a vector quantity which actually signifies the distance from the oscillator to the equilibrium position. Our amplitude A is the maximum value of our displacement, uh, which is the distance to the equilibrium position. So um, time period T, this is the time it takes to complete one full oscillation. Your frequency is the number of oscillations per unit time. And and the angular frequency omega is your rate of change of angular displacement. Just as a reminder, angular frequency is different to uh, angular velocity. It's actually a scalar quantity. It's the magnitudes of angular velocity. However, the mathematics behind the two quantities is exactly the same. So omega is uh, the rate of change of uh, angular displacement. Um, the angular displacement in this case, uh, even when there's no circular motion happening, is just how far away through the cycle we've gone. So for instance, one full cycle is... Uh, is 2 pi and that occurs in one time period so we can still use that omega is 2 pi over t and we can still use that omega is equal to 2 pi f what is simple harmonic motion remember simple harmonic motion has two defining characteristics number one is that the acceleration is directly proportional to the displacement and additionally, the acceleration is always directed towards the equilibrium position. Now, this is summarized into the defining equation of simple harmonic motion that the acceleration, as we can see, is directly proportional to the displacement x, with that constant of proportionality being the uh, negative angular frequency squared. Now, if we had a graph of the acceleration on the y-axis and x, the displacement on the x-axis, this graph would be a straight line for the origin, and that tells us that the acceleration is proportional to the displacement. And we'll also have a negative gradient, which means that the acceleration is towards the equilibrium position. If we apply y equals mx plus c analysis, so just underneath here we could write y is equal to mx uh, plus c. I'm going to add a little plus zero over on this side. And uh, we can see that the acceleration is on the y-axis. We can see that it goes through the origin, so that the intercept is zero. X is on, surprise, surprise, the x-axis. That means that our gradient, which is going to be negative by the way, is minus the angular frequency squared. So we can use this graph to figure out many important quantities because we know that the gradient m is going to equal to minus omega squared. We can use the, uh, the gradient to find many important quantities. Let's say that the gradient is equal to m. Now, because this is minus omega squared, this is also going to equal to minus 2 pi f squared. We can also use it to find the time period because omega is 2 pi over the, over the time period. So 2 pi t over t all of it squared. Don't worry about this negative sign because as, as you can see the uh, gradient is negative so the two minus signs are going to cancel each other out. Okay now let's have a look how can we perform an experiment to actually measure the uh, frequency of a simple harmonic oscillator. Now in order to determine either the frequency or the time period we need the following setup. We have a spring or it could be a different oscillator for example a pendulum and we're going to be using a lap stand and we'll also be putting a fiducial marker. Remember that's just a visual reference point and um, if we place it at the equilibrium position we will know that uh, every time the marker passes through this position uh, this will be one time period. So we're going to displace the mass and then let it oscillate. I'm going to measure 10 time periods and then we're going to divide our measurements by 10 to get the time period. I'm going to make sure that to do all the measurements from eye level to avoid a parallax error. I'm going to be taking multiple measurements and then finding the mean to improve our accuracy. Once we have the time period we can find the frequency using f is equal to 1 over t. Then if we wanted to we could find our angular the frequency using omega is 2 pi f for instance. 
Now let's have a look at some solutions to the uh, defining equation for simple harmonic motion a is equal to minus omega squared times x. Now there are two solutions for x. x is equal to a cos omega t and x is equal to a sine omega t. Now before I move on, I've written this in some funky colors that we must always use radians for this. So our calculator needs to be in radian mode in order to solve these equations. So we use x is equal to a cosine omega t when at the starting point t is equal to zero the oscillator is at the amplitude position for example if we release a, if we release a pendulum from the amplitude we're going to use x is equal to a cos omega t and we're going to use x is equal to a sine omega t when at the initial time the oscillator is at the equilibrium this is because of the shape of cosine which uh, starts from the amplitude and sine which uh, starts from the origin now uh, let's provide an example for one of those for example we have a uh, spring oscillating with a frequency of 5 hertz and an amplitude, amplitude of 4 centimeters the spring is initially released from its amplitude well that statement tells me that what I'm going to need to use is x is equal to a cosine omega t um, okay find the displacement two seconds after the release Okay, um, so well, we're ready to use this equation. Remember, omega is 2 pi f, and we're given the standard frequency. So we're going to need to just rewrite this as x is equal to a cosine of 2 pi f t. Yeah, so this is really, really important. Now we're ready to plug in some numbers. So our amplitude is 4 centimeters, which is 4 times 10 to the power of minus 2. And we're going to multiply this by the cosine of 2 pi uh, times the frequency which is 5 hertz times the uh, time which is 2 seconds like so and if we put this into a scientific calculator in radian mode remember really really important we are going to get a displacement of 0.04 meters what we need to look at next are graphs in simple harmonic motion and normally you'll be given one of those graphs in an exam question you'd be asked to uh, transform this to a different type of graph for instance you might be given a uh, displacement against time graph and you'd be asked to transform it into a velocity against time graph now um, notice that um, when x is positive in this region the velocity is negative so how do we know to start this graph in this precise way well remember that velocity is the rate of change of displacement so v is equal to delta x over delta t now this is actually the gradient of this first curve so in fact we are plotting the gradient of this x against t curve on the v against t curve now right over here we can see that the gradient is decreasing the gradient of the tangent is decreasing so in this portion over here so that means that we need to start our uh, sinusoid with a uh, with a negative gradient we'll do exactly the same if we are um, plotting a graph of the acceleration against time as well Notice how, uh, well, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. In other words, this is the gradient of the graph below. Now, the gradient, as you can see, is decreasing. So that means that the uh, graph of the acceleration is going to start in the negative region as well. In other words, the acceleration will be negative to begin with before it turns positive and then negative back again. Okay, folks, now let's have a look at damping. Now, we have over here a graph of uh, displacement against time. The silver one is with no damping, and this blue one is with light damping. There are two major effects that we can see visible over here. Number one, the amplitude decreases. And number two is that the time period remains the same. Remember, this is a consequence of the fact that in simple harmonic motion, the time period is independent of the amplitude, which is a really, really important result that we could also test experimentally. 
Now, the heavier the damping is, the more exaggerated that effect is with the amplitude uh, decreasing more and more. Uh, for instance, if I had heavier damping, I might see something like this, and then the actual amplitude might decrease even further like that. So essentially with each oscillation that amplitude is decreasing steadily with each cycle. And if I had something like uh, let's say the velocity of that oscillator against time you would see a steady decrease in the maximum speed of that oscillator. Okay guys, so let's have a look at the difference between free and forced oscillations. So remember, in a free oscillation, the system is only disturbed initially and then it oscillates with no external forces. And an example of this could be to use an external force just to release the pendulum and then let it oscillate with no external forces. Now in a forced oscillation, there's a driving force which, uh, which is applied during the oscillation. As an example of that, we have a signal generator which is connected to a spring and it's making the spring oscillate. Now, uh, if we were to have a free oscillation, then we take an object and then we release it, that object will be oscillating at its natural frequency, which is the frequency at which an object will oscillate after an initial disturbance. Now, if we suddenly apply a driving frequency, for example, the, the driving frequency could be a person which is pushing this, uh, this pendulum, and if the frequency of the driving force matches the natural frequency, resonance occurs and the amplitude increases dramatically. If we were to plot the uh, amplitude against the frequency and see how it varies if we have an oscillator and we keep on increasing the frequency, initially the amplitude will start increasing until we hit that natural frequency where the amplitude is going to be extremely high. If we keep on increasing the frequency, then the amplitude will be steadily decreasing. Now, if we introduce some damping into the system, the amplitude will be lower throughout all of the oscillations and additionally, the peak is going to be shifted to the left at a lower frequency. So uh, these, this blue curve over here is our resonance curve with damping. So if we introduce damping, once again two things happen. Uh, the amplitude decreases, so I'm just going to say a decreases throughout all of the points and additionally uh, the peak occurs at a lower frequency. So peak amplitude occurs at a lower frequency, which uh, gives the appearance of this curve being shifted to the left. And finally, let's have a look at some examples of resonance. For example, we can have a microwave oven. In this case, the driving frequency is the frequency of the EM radiation, which matches the natural frequency of the water molecules. And this causes re resonance, increasing the amplitude and the kinetic energies of the molecules of the food. Another example and a problematic example of resonance could be an oscillating bridge. The driving force from the wind or even some people walking could match the natural frequency of the bridge. This will cause resonance and an increase in amplitude of vibration of the bridge. Notice that in each of those cases I have identified the driving frequency over here and um, I've said that it meets or it matches the natural frequency causing resonance and increasing the amplitude. So those are the key words when you're providing resonance examples. Okay folks, we have actually managed to go through the entire specification of oscillations. Excellent job if you've gone through the whole of this uh, video and remember now it's time to solve every possible past paper question on oscillations. Let's do it. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If, if there are any questions, please feel free to uh, drop a comment and please consider subscribing.